Okay, uh, I'm going to set a timer uh, so that I try not to go over the limit here. Uh, um, my name is Douglas Henderson. I'm a sound artist, and sound art is a very broad field, so that doesn't actually mean very much. Uh, I'm principally concerned these days with the point at which visual art and sound art uh, or sound and, and visual can come together. And the, the collision point there can generate some very rich hybrid art forms. Uh, I'm using hybrid not in the way that Ars Electronica uses it, but in the general uh, biological sense. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about my general practice. This will be a sort of thread, <laughs> because there's not much time. Uh, which leads eventually to the piece uh, underway. And this will give you some, possibly some insight into uh, how underway was, uh, where it came from in the, in the past in my work. Um, principal interest of mine has always been uh, how sound operates in space, um, also how I can manipulate it in space. Uh, for a long time, I was exploring whether it was actually possible to make shapes out of sound in space that would actually be palpable, that you could almost feel. Um, and I will bring up some Morton Feldman for that. Uh, I was often using surround sound arrays. Um, these, I, after a while, became a bit disenchanted with because I always found that I was in the center of a, of a sort of hurricane, that the audience was always at the calm center of a hurricane of sound that's whirling around in many speakers. And I always wanted the sound to come to me somehow. Uh, and reading this line by Morton Feldman, uh, sound is all our dreams of music, noise is music's dream of us. Well, I read that quite a long time ago and I spent about two years thinking about it uh, before it started to generate some ideas for me, I still don't know what it means. I, I can't get a handle on it. Only, only Morty knows. Uh, but one of the things that it suggested strongly to me is that uh, it's not just that we listen to music. Music can also listen to us. And I wanted to uh, develop that further, to find a way where music or sound or whatever, the composition could become another character in a play in which the audience is also a part. So uh, to somehow have the sound be a, a partner and, and another actor in this sort of game of life. Um, the first uh, thing I tried to do with that was a, was a very practical uh, solution, which was a technical solution. Uh, I was working on a piece called Fadensonnen, um, based on a Paul Celan poem. And I decided to work with a, uh, a central speaker tower. And I eventually settled on a sort of uh, this is actually eight speakers on top of each other in a helical formation. Uh, this was extremely satisfying from, from a visceral point of view, from the way that it was possible to make sound move. Uh, I found various techniques using phase that I could actually throw the sound very convincingly out to the walls or bring it to the center. There's left, there's right, there's vertical dimension, but there's also front and back. So this was a whole new uh, sort of sound topography to explore. And uh, I was enjoying that very much, except that every day I would walk into the studio and I would see that thing. Uh, and it's not a very attractive gadget. Uh, speakers are not made to be looked at. They are meant to be the neutral purveyors of whatever you want to put through them. And I realized that for this sound piece to work, I needed the, the, the diffusing organ to become part of the poem, to become part of, uh, to become a sculptural element. Here's the, the poem that it was based on, uh, Thread Sons, a very, very short poem, but exceedingly rich in, in uh, imagery. And, 
and quite optimistic, which is very unusual for Paul Celan. This was written just before he died in uh, 1969, I believe it was. Um, and so I decided what I needed to do was to create a, a version of this, of this sort of tower of ugly loudspeakers that would directly reflect the poem. So very, and very simple one-to-one -one relationships. Uh, and that, because that was also the sound uh, composition I was working on was very similar. The sound composition was a translation into sound of the poem. The text was never read in the, in the, in the piece. Um, and this is what I came up with. The, uh, the rope I selected because of the, the optimism and the sort of upward feeling of the, oops, what happened? We seem to have lost, there it is. Oh, interesting. Um, the poem being a sort of optimistic uh, one, I felt that it was pulling upward, so I decided to use a rope that gives a sort of upward feeling to it. At the bottom is the gray-black waist, which is represented by a, a chunk of concrete, and blue for sky, orange for sun. These are all very, very simple um, relationships to the poem. And uh, this, this worked rather well, actually. Uh, in the end, I was able to create uh, uh, something that you can almost, as you approach the object, you can almost feel the sound field. It's almost palpable. About one and a half to two meters away, you get to a point where you say, this, this is where the sound field starts. And I don't know how, I don't know if that's a, poetic sensation or a technical sensation or a biological one, but it was very palpable. Um, so I, I felt that, that this was a successful uh, road and to be continued. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm just about on time here. Uh, so here's another view. You can see the, the speakers. This was an eight-channel eight piece again. Uh, every other speaker is paralleled. And there's the rope. I hid all the wire inside the rope. I got to learn how to make rope. That was interesting. Uh, and here's, a, here's a, a list of the sound sources. Uh, I'm not going to recite this for you. I'm just trying to um, give an idea. Uh, the, I used the vertical aspect of the, of the piece to underline the actual physical vert verticality in the poem, the imagery of the base, I mean, these footsteps, the gray-black waist. At the top were bird sounds and the, uh, these tones generated by some child's uh, magnetic brush toy. Um, so the, the space informed the composition and vice versa, and the object informed the composition, they became completely locked together. And uh, this is what I've been looking for, is this is like a new, it, it becomes a new form. There's nothing that you can look at or listen to within the piece that doesn't depend on the other. Uh, another, another idea for this kind of diffusion was to spread the speakers out in the room and place them at, at a height where people could, would hear them very, very closely. And I'm still going a little over. Okay, but in, in order, I won't go into the composition, but uh, a simple discovery occurred to me. Uh, if I want to move a sound around, I could pan it from speaker to speaker. That's pretty simple. Set up a whole bunch of speakers. Um, and uh, the other option is, to move the speaker. Uh, that becomes a technical headache. Uh, with this piece, I had already decided on these shapes. There are speakers in each of these little houses. And this kind of suggestive phonograph or smoke uh, or flower or whatever it is coming out the top, I leave it open, um, being a very directed uh, sort of beam of sound. And the idea with the composition was that anywhere you stand in the room, you hear a part of the composition, but not the whole thing. The composition was, was developed as an interlocking series of modules, and the listener and counterer walks through the space and basically recomposes the piece for themselves. Uh, 
in the course of building these things, I discovered uh, by an incredibly simple Neanderthal simple mechanism, I could actually turn these. Um, and the, the rotation, there are no motors. There is no computer running that. It's only from the soundtrack. They respond directly to the vibrations of the speaker membrane. Uh, so suddenly I was able to, to multiply the complexity of the sound field by, a, 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 I don't know, infinite amount. Um, and this got me more interested in, in seeing what I could do with with a loudspeaker membrane and a very simple, simple operations uh, involving uh, physical resonance and pendulum effects. Uh, and then I came to underway. This was uh, originally a piece that was a, a proposal for the Deutsche Klangkunstpreis, uh, now known as the European Sound Art Award. Uh, they wanted proposals for pieces that would fit in their museum. And uh, there was a specific room that was in the basement of the museum. And I visited the place, and it's a, the building, uh, the horrendous, brutalist uh, architecture, uh, really very hard to look at. And it reminded me of nothing so much as a large container ship that had somehow landed in the middle of the Ruhrgebiet. And I thought, um, the object of this piece will be to free the museum from, from itself, from its architecture, and to, and to free the encounterer also to basically sail the ship and uh, take a journey. Um, I realized that <laughs> this was not going to be uh, physically easy, and that it could only be done by poetic and metaphorical means, uh, that I needed I needed to use kind of poetic inversions to, to recalibrate the mind as it, as it uh, was involved in the piece. So uh, layers of sort of poetic inversion, but also layers of visceral phenomena that would, I would need to use a, a lot of tricks to, to keep the focus of the mind on this motion. Um, and the result was, uh, Basically, I, I installed an artificial horizon inside the uh, museum in, and, and in the basement, so it was a very good place to destabilize the whole building uh, with a, a, a fully immersive soundtrack that drives the uh, proposed subject as well as the sort of spatial orientation. Uh, in order to figure out, a, I, I needed to research this because I had an idea of, of roughly what I might do, which was to install a kind of projector into the middle of the space, but then the projector needs to also feed the image and feed the metaphor. It couldn't just be a, a, a light projector. So I was uh, studying some old, <laughs> this is funny, this relates to Nello, studying old compasses uh, from the 16th and 17th century that are used on ships. Uh, for navigation. We come, we come back around to the first talk. Uh, and at the time, the only way that you, could, that you could know where you are to orient yourself, you needed to know exactly what time it was. So they went to a great deal of trouble to make the clocks stable so that they put them on these, on these gimbals to keep them completely steady and then theoretically they would keep better time. As it turns out, didn't work, they didn't work all that well, but there were many, many designs, and all with this same kind of gimbaled uh, structure. I was also looking at the astrolabe, another instrument of navigation, and with all these influences, I started building the piece. Um, I was, uh, <clears throat> okay, yeah. I've got a note to myself here. How does it work? <laughs> Uh, but first, I'll, I'll, talk a well, I'll talk a little bit about um, what the moving speaker part, the, the point of it. Here was the initial drawing. Um, and the idea was to have this moving speaker instead of the compass, so kind of turn the compass inside out, because a compass is something you look into, and a speaker is something that broadcasts out. 
So this is another one of these kind of metaphorical poetic inversions in addition to taking a horizon and putting it inside a building. I'm trying to build layers of, of these paradoxes. Um, and I, a, a number of things about this seemed immediately attractive. One is, yes, I'm, I'm moving, I can move the sound because the speaker will move and it'll point to different parts of the room and activate different reflections. Uh, then I needed a horizon, so I said, well, maybe, okay, if I can put some lights in a circle around the thing, I should be able to get a shadow line off the speaker, and with so many lights, it would actually make quite a complicated uh, shadow. It wouldn't be just a flat, straight shadow, but much more watery somehow. Um, and this was just a, a sketch I did for, for the uh, proposal, so with the, the idea of, of the shadow line. And this was the eventual, the eventual object as it, as it occurred. Um, how does it work? Well, that's, uh, it's also unbelievably simple, again, because I, I, my work is only what I can do as a person. Uh, Russell Edson is one of my favorite poets and he has a book which is simply entitled What a Man Can See and I think yes what a sound artist can do and for me that's my connection to all the aspects the sculpture how the how the materials are chosen it's all things that I know how to work with how the sound material is chosen it's always things that are very close to me it's not exotic sound recordings um, this is, it is amazingly simple. Uh, it's hard to point out here, but you can see there's a small piece of wire at the center. And uh, it, re it just sticks down and presses on the membrane of the speaker. Now you can imagine if you have a speaker and a nice gimbal, all you need to do is push it and it's gonna start moving. So in this case, instead of the, instead of the uh, wire pushing, the speaker pushes against the wire. Uh, very, very low frequency sine waves. And even that, speakers don't really convey energy that efficiently, but this is a pendulum, essentially. So it's a resonant system. And in this case, it's a, it's a um, dual pendulum. It's a compound pendulum. And e the x-axis and y-axis uh, uh, oscillate at different frequencies. So I can actually quite accurately control how it's moving, how much it's moving, if it goes more this way or if it goes more this way, just by feeding it different frequencies. So there's a, all, the, all the way through the piece, there's a mix of frequencies uh, going into it. And these are, of course, synchronized with the, uh, with the soundtrack. Uh, for the, okay, you'll stop me if I'm going over, right? Okay. Uh, for, for the soundtrack, I decided to, uh, I, that I needed to drive the uh, nodes in the room, so uh, um, standing waves. This, uh, this is something you can hear demonstrated in a number of Alvin Lucier pieces, very beautiful, very simple, a speaker on a wall producing a sine wave. And you start walking through the room and you hear all the cancellation points where that sound seems to disappear. Well, this is, of course, happening all the time around us, every day, any room we are in. Uh, I, it's particularly noticeable when you have a tone. So I wanted some tonal material, a steady-ish tone, uh, coming out through that upper loudspeaker and realizing that not only would it produce standing waves, but the standing waves would constantly change as the orientation of the loudspeaker is changing. So this is another aspect of, of a kind of disorientation exercise, almost on a subconscious level. Uh, so what the sound that I used was I took a bottle and put a microphone inside it, and I threw it into the ocean, uh, into the Ostsee, actually, um, and pulled it back in and threw it in a few times. And that's the principal recording. It's then manipulated a bit because, as it turns out, it doesn't sound very watery, and I also wanted something watery. What it sounds like is uh, what a message in a bottle is, would hear, which is everything resonated at the frequency of the bottle. So I, I had my tone great, but not any poetry really to go along with it. 
So it was convolved with a number of different water sounds. I think the, the, uh, there was um, my heating system in my house was particularly gurgly, and I, I was able to pull uh, an impulse response off the heating pipes and convolve the, uh, the sound of that bottle. So that's what's coming off the top. You also get Doppler shifts because of the movement. You get changes in the uh, frequency response. So from a single speaker really trying to reproduce a single tone, you get an incredibly elaborate uh, uh, and changing structure of, of sound and through the reflections on the ceiling. Uh, then there is also the base of the piece. So I, was, I was quite happy with that, but I also wanted to use another sound source, which was uh, a cloth, heavy cloth, flapping. And uh, I was trying to figure out, well, I could put speakers around, but that's exactly what I hate in life, is this surround sound. And uh, I had actually made the recording live with four microphones and kind of dancing around with this piece of cloth. And I thought, well, what happens if I take that kind of recording and put, it in, uh, put four loudspeakers into the bass facing outwards? And it was a, a fortuitous arrangement. Uh, it turns out that the phase cancellations uh, and phase differentials that, uh, of the recording are concentrated in one space, and you hear, you hear less coming from that spot and more coming from the walls. So it actually pushes the sound out to the walls almost, almost physically. Um, so the, and that was another, yet another satisfying inversion because the flapping of the cloth somehow becomes waves. So there's some, some convolution involved in that, but uh, and the cloth is below you and the water is above. So this is another sort of flipping the sailboat upside down. And I think all of these little, it's like just adjusting little, little adjustments all everywhere you can find them. And finally, there's this quite convincing image of, of this uh, sort of sea journey taking place in the, whatever building it's installed in. Um, in fact, at the original installation, two people did develop seasickness, so I was very pleased with that. <laughs> um, that is, uh, you can see it, I'm not going to show a video of it because it's right over there. Uh, that's my conclusion. Thank you very much uh, for coming, and thank you, Ars Electronica.